you heard about this universal basic income thing? I have heard something about it. You that. have heard about this? All yes. right. Well, I guess then, can you define universal basic income for those who have no idea? I'm giving, I mean, this is a freaking softball, man. Here you go. Yes, uh, universal basic income is a policy where every member of a society, let's say every US citizen, gets a certain amount of money to meet your basic needs, no questions asked. So my proposal, the Freedom Dividend, would put $1,000 a month in the hands of every American adult starting at age 18 to do whatever you want. And that's universal basic income. It sounds dramatic now in 2019, but Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country. Martin Luther King championed it in the 1960s. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be great for America, um, also in the 60s and 70s. It passed the U.S. House of Rep Representatives twice in 1971 under Nixon, and one state has had a dividend for almost 40 years where everyone in Alaska now gets between one and $2,000 a year. So I know at first blush, everyone getting $1,000 a month sounds uh, very dramatic and almost too good to be true, but it actually is very, very deeply rooted in American thought. And when you say everyone, you mean the person that's, from someone that's unemployed to someone that is worth 20 million bucks. They're both getting that thousand dollars? Yep, that's right. Okay, now how are we gonna pay for this thing, right? That has to be the next question. Yes, so, um, so first it ends up costing a lot less than most people think, um, and there are a few reasons for this. Number one is that about half of Americans are already getting direct support from the government in some form. So my dividend would be universal, but it's opt-in, and if you opt-in, you forego benefits from certain existing programs. So the headline cost goes down a lot very quickly. Because so, what could, so this is like someone that's, that's getting some other social welfare or something, and then if they choose to take the UBI, so like what type of thing would they lose? Like food stamps or like yes, what, what so are it's about? uh it's full food stamps, uh housing subsidies, uh fuel subsidies, cash and cash like programs. We have about 120 welfare programs, most of which are cash or cash like. So this excludes uh Medicaid, uh, but it would include food stamps and uh most other welfare programs. Right. And can you can you split the difference on that? So could you say I'm gonna only take five hundred a month UBI and I'm gonna take you know, 500, no. so you can't. So you have to pick one, basically. Yes. Yeah. And so I've talked to people who are on various welfare programs and they love the idea of getting $1,000 unconditional because they dislike the case manager, the reporting requirements, everything else. And so you can reduce the enrollments in our existing program significantly. Uh, and so, and it brings down the headline cost very quickly because if someone's already getting $700 in benefits, then the cost is $300 instead of 1000 do, do we have good accounting numbers on actually how much people are getting? Like, I'm going to guess that a certain amount of people, it may be one thing for food stamps, but when you talk about housing subsidies and things like that, that has to be way more. I mean, the, the one that I always use is that my sister and her husband live in New York City, struggling to get by. They both have full-time jobs, two kids. You can imagine how expensive schools are and just living in Manhattan and the rest yep. of it. And half of their building is market price and half is rent subsidized. And then what happens is, and I know you know this, is that generation after generation live in the same apartment then for like you know 400 bucks. And then my sister and her husband end up paying 4,000 bucks for a tiny two bedroom. So that people, people basically just get locked in these programs where if you were to say to the guy that's living in an apartment for 600 bucks, here's a thousand bucks, you got to get going, nobody's going to do it. You'd have to be an idiot to do it basically. Well, I, I, I think knowing what I know about New York and the um, subsidized rents, it's not a federal program, I don't believe. And so like their situation might be that they actually get the thousand bucks and then they, they, it, it's helpful to them. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in terms of the math, it ends up reducing the headline cost of this by hundreds of billions of dollars very, very quickly because people will either not opt in or if they do opt in, it costs a lot less than $1,000 a head. So that's reason number one where, it, where that reduces the cost from like a top line, let's call it $3 trillion a year, it goes down um, pretty quickly. The second big thing is that the money doesn't disappear. In our hands, it ends up getting circulated through the economy over and over again, what I call the trickle-up economy. Uh, and so if you see that it would end up increasing consumer buying power and the size of the economy by about uh, 10 to 12 percent, we would generate hundreds of billions in new tax revenue just on the basis of more economic activity in our society. We'd also save hundreds of billions on things like incarceration, homelessness services, emergency room health care and things that we're already spending about a trillion on. Meaning because people are going to use that money for those things? 
uh, either that or we have to we get to spend less on it. Um, so one of the examples that, and this is going to sound very politician-y, so I apologize, but I, I was in New Hampshire, uh, and a corrections officer in New Hampshire said we should pay people to stay out of jail. Uh, because you got to give me their name and tell me you put your, their arm around them and the whole, you know, I really ham it up for a pause. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a pause I, really on, I was man. like, I was there. And, um, and, and so we, we think we're saving money, but we end up spending the money on the back end anyway. If someone ends up falling through the cracks and they land in our institutions, our institutions are incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least one estimate was that if you reduce poverty in this country, you would increase our GDP by $700 billion just on the basis of higher graduation rates, um, better physical health, and better mental health. So we're going to get back a lot of the money. But the big change we need to make to, bit, to pay for this dividend is that right now, Amazon, trillion dollar tech company, paid zero in federal taxes last year. Mm -hmm. Netflix, zero in federal taxes, less than you did on this awesome <laughs> operation. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know Amazon's investing billions in AI. It's going to be one of the mega winners from uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So we need to have a mechanism where the American people actually get some of that. Uh, and so. Uh, my big proposal is that we have to join every other advanced economy in the world and have a value-added tax that, that then gets the American public a tiny slice of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, every robot truck mile. And because our economy is now so vast at $20 trillion, even a mild value-added tax generates over $800 billion in new revenue. So that, plus the savings from existing programs, plus the economic growth, uh, plus the value gains enough to pay for a dividend of $1,000 a month. So I know that a certain percentage of my audience, they know that generally I'm a, I'm a small government guy, or I want, it to be, I want it to be as small as it can be to function, as, as a general rule. So it could be, it could be streamlined enough. I, I want it to exist well enough so that things are working without all of the fat and all of the pork and all of the rest of it. Um, but so some of my alarms go off here when, because of the idea of that this would be federal in nature, so that a thousand bucks if you live in, say, Los Angeles, you get, you get next to nothing. Thousand bucks if you live maybe in uh, you know somewhere in the middle of the country, you're going to get a lot more. Is there any way you can compensate for any of that, or you th or is that not even worth thinking about in your estimation? Or well, there are, there are a few reasons why it's good. To, it's a good idea to keep it uniform. Uh, number one is that there are other reasons why people live in LA. Often, uh, not just the weather, yeah. but but <laughs> that, access that's to pretty certain, much it. Yeah. But access to certain economic opportunities. So you're making a trade-off already. And uh, it's also very hard to administer because the fact is, if you're getting paid more to live in an expensive place, a lot of people would live <laughs> in an expensive place and they'd like sneak off and right. you know spend the money someplace cheaper. So um, it, it's much cleaner for everyone to make it uniform. It also ends up fueling mobility in both directions because at least some people might feel like, hey, if I leave LA and go, uh, you know, go to Arizona, like I can actually live much better. Uh, you know, it's like it, it will help balance things out. Mm -hmm. What, what do you say just to the general idea, the, sort of, I guess, the, the philosophical idea that if you just keep giving people things, that eventually they just start doing less for themselves? That a thousand bucks, like, yeah, maybe there's some place in the country that you could live, then you could play video games all day and smoke pot all day and, and not really do much, and that we're going to sort of, we're going to cushion people's ability to, to not just get up and get going. Well, not so, that people want that, but that just human nature is, oh, I start getting something and I can just kind of ease up a little bit. So there are, there are three things I would say. First, I agree with your vision of government. And the great thing about this is that this actually does not grow the federal bureaucracy. What we all hate is when you have money just flow up to the pipes and then disappear and then you know you never see it again and you don't know what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. um, this actually puts the economic resources back in our hands. It's one of the reasons why the only state that's done this is Alaska, which is a deep red conservative state passed by a Republican governor, and it's wildly popular there. Like the dividends, everyone's favorite thing about what the government does, because it's not a giant government program. It's actually almost cost free to administer and mm -hmm. just puts money right into our hands. So I agree with your vision of government, is that the last thing I want is like an ar a new army of bureaucrats running around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but do you fear that even, even if everything you've said is, is completely on point, that any time you, just the way that the system works, at least now, that any time you try to put in a giant federal program, that the bureaucrats and just that middle management part of the government will figure out ways. Like you could be like, oh, it's real easy, guys. We got 320 million people in the country. Everyone's getting a thousand bucks. The math works out. It's like, it's all good. But that then just the process of how government works will create all sorts of other problems. 
Well, if you look at the way they do it in Alaska, it's actually very lightweight. Like, as long as they can prove you're an Alaskan resident, you're there, it's like, this is how many people you are. Like, they have a very, very low uh, level um, administrative burden, mm -hmm. let, let's say. So as long as you can pull that off, which, in my opinion, like, this is where we have to go because, uh, <coughs> because as the economy is transforming, uh, and so, so number one, uh, I agree with your vision of, of small government if we can achieve it. And, and so I'm going to come back to it with number three. Yeah. And that number two is uh, number two is the biggest misconception about this is that it's somehow going to reduce work. And what I mean by this is you put this money into our hands, it has a, first it creates two million new jobs immediately in the economy. Uh, because just more economic activity, the smoothie shop hires someone, the mechanic needs a you know a, an assistant, like on and on through the economy. So basically, people have more expendable income, more shopping occurs. Yeah, pretty much the easiest way to say that. Right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other thing, though, that it does, it ends up fueling a lot of the work that right now our mar our market does not recognize. Um, so that's some of the stuff that you've done throughout your career, like arts, creativity, entrepreneurship. Like a lot of that stuff doesn't get recognized by the market till. Um, you become, you know, frankly, like yeah, somewhat yeah. successful. Um, but also work like my wife does. My wife's at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic, and the market values her work at zero, even though it's incredibly hard and incredibly important. So it's not that putting this money into our hands somehow makes us work less. It creates conventional work. It ends up um, also uh, fueling the sort of work that we want to do. So that that's uh, number two. And then number three is this notion of what's happening in our economy. If you look around at the fact that suicides and drug overdoses have overtaken vehicle deaths for the first time in American history, our life expectancy has declined for the last three years, almost unheard of in a developed country. Mm -hmm. You know the last time our life expectancy declined three years in a row? I guess it was probably like in the late 1920s, something like that? Yeah, it was the Spanish flu of 1918. It's like where that killed millions of people. Oh. Uh, and so, and this buzzsaw is just going to accelerate uh, when AI comes in and starts getting rid of call center workers and uh, bookkeepers and accounts and the rest of it. Um, and so when you're facing a set of changes that, that's this mammoth, putting cash into people's hands is actually the most lightweight thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Some of the other proposals that are out there are the ones that we must avoid, which are things like a, like a jobs guarantee or like creating like a whole new array of uh, of subsistence jobs for so, so that's Americans a to that's a massive difference you have than some of the other Democratic candidates, right? Because uh, Bernie and I think Elizabeth Warren and a couple others are talking about a federal go jobs guarantee, which yeah. which to me again as a, as a basically a small government guy that sounds horrible to me. Like that that sounds like indentured servitude to me. Yes, uh, one of the things that's it's like why not just get everyone gray overalls while you're at yeah. it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you right. Like, give, us the, give us the uniform and we'll fi flip widgets all day and that's it. Yeah, and so I try and point out obvious things. It's like, hey, what if someone doesn't like the job they have? What if they're bad at it? What if they don't like their boss? What if their boss doesn't like them? What if the job actually, like, you know, turns out uh, you don't need it after a while? Like, if you're literally dependent upon a government job to survive and, like, actually have food on the table, then all of those things become existential. Uh, and you end up creating a whole new army of bureaucrats to administer this, like, uh, massive jobs program. So I'm for infrastructure. Uh, uh, creating jobs, like because those are jobs you know you need. We need to rebuild the infrastructure. But starting out saying we're going to guarantee everyone a job is exactly what we have to avoid. So, so when they say that, when when you hear them say that, do you honestly think that they believe that is the right thing to do, or or even a feasible thing to do, or that they're just saying because it sounds? If you're not really thinking about these issues that hard, to me, saying free everything sounds good. It all sounds good: free college, free this, free job. You know, all of these things. Just if you're not thinking, it's just like, oh, great, free, why not? Let's do it. If you're young and you haven't really well, put the, the acumen in to, to figure out what these things mean. One of the dangers is that a lot of these politicians have never actually run a business, worked in a business, understand what the mechanics of these organizations look like on the ground. Um, they're just lurching from press release to fundraiser to cable news hit, and they don't understand what a lived reality would be for a person who has to show up and like check in for their uh, their Mick job, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, yeah. Um, and, and the institutionalization of this thinking, it is sincere. Like, it's not like if you poke the person who's for a federal jobs guarantee, they're like, ah, I was just kidding. No, no, I mean, like, they actually feel that. Uh, and well, they feel it, right, but I guess feeling it and knowing are two different things. Well, right? I mean, they, they believe it, let's put it that way. Okay. They're sincere in their belief. Uh, 
And, and so if you buy that we're in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in the history of the world, which we are, and then in my mind you wind up with like a couple of major uh, models to try and um, respond to it. And my model is put economic buying power into the hands of every adult as fast as possible and help us rebuild our own communities, our own lives, our own families, and like find new forms of work that we find fulfilling and purposeful. The other model, in my opinion, is the government trying to figure out what sort of work we find <laughs> meaningful and valuable and purposeful. Yeah. And this, to me, is what we must avoid at all costs. Right, well, it's also a self-perpetuating thing, right? Because then the government always has to grow. We always have more people. We will always need more jobs. So they will always keep bringing more and more people into the system. Yeah, and, and to give you a sense of the immediacy of this, as we're sitting here together in year 10, 10 of an expansion, the US labor force participation rate is close to a multi-decade low of 63%. Uh, the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. Wait, say that again, 63% are... of, of working age Americans are presently in the workforce. Hmm. So uh, when we hear this thing about uh, uh, job... Uh, headline uh, unemployment. Yeah, 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 that unemployment is at an all-time lower, this type of thing. That doesn't factor in that people just have checked out, right? Is yes. that, that's basically what you're getting to? Yeah, and if you remember candidate Trump in 2015, he was like, oh, this headline unemployment number is fake news, it's bunk, 95 million Americans out of the workforce. Uh, uh, and now he's in office and he's like, oh, like, <laughs> it's great. He was right the first time because if you leave the workforce, you're not calculated into the headline unemployment number. It also doesn't include the fact that 94% of the new jobs created since 2005 are temporary gig or contract jobs. It doesn't include the fact that 44% of recent college graduates are underemployed in a job that uh, doesn't require a degree. So the headline unemployment number is at best misleading and incomplete, at worst, uh, bullshit. Like it's, it's somewhere in, in that range. It, it, right, so what, what about, I think a, cer some, a certain set of people would basically say, well, all right, some of, some of this is making sense and I can see why it would get rid of some of the bureaucracy and you're, not, you're doing a governmental program but not totally expanding the government, but why not just do it for people under, say, $50,000 so that you don't need to give it to the guy that's making 75,000 that lives in Kansas City who's got a decent life, uh, but why not just give it to the people 50,000, you know, whatever the, whatever the number whatever you the might come up, come up with. Sure. There, there are a few reasons. So one of the reasons why it's so wildly popular in Alaska is that it's universal. So it's not like, oh, uh, rich Alaskans don't get it, poor Alaskans do. It's just like, no, you live here, it's a right of citizenship, you get your dividend. And so by making it so it's not a rich to poor transfer, you destigmatize it, you universalize it, and then you make it more politically popular because it's just something that we all get as citizens and owners and shareholders of the richest, most advanced country in the history of the world. Number two, you get rid of any incentive to underreport your income uh, or to uh, have monitoring requirements. Let's say I'm married to someone who's not working. Um, and then maybe we could be like, hey, how about we file separately? And then you make uh, nothing, and then you can get the dividend. And like, so basically, like all this it removes the cliff situation where you'd actually want to earn less, right? So or this, this is one less, of the things right. that I've struggled with the most about this, about the general idea, not the way you're laying it out. But that I, I don't like things that de incentivize people to make more. And I, you, know, you mentioned this thing before about you could struggle for a long time, and then suddenly you're making more. And it's like, last year, I paid more in taxes than I had ever made in my entire life before that. And like that, so I don't like the idea that the more work you do, the more value you bring, the more you sort of get punished. You know? Yeah, and, and that's one of the problems with our current welfare programs. Like, uh, and the extreme examples, uh, a friend of mine, his sister is on disability. Um, she was afraid to volunteer uh, at a nonprofit because she was afraid someone would say you're healthy and then take away her, her benefits. I mean, what a terrible incentive system yeah. that is. Um, but most welfare programs are constructed such that if you flourish, then you get less. Whereas if you have a dividend that's universal, you know, you do nothing, you get the dividend, you do something, you get the dividend, then like your incentive is actually to do something. <laughs> so wh why not just blow apart? So I think the best libertarian argument that I've heard for UBI is that basically if you want to do UBI, it's got the right idea, why not just blow apart the social safety net as is, Take because we know it's just a boondoggle of middle management nonsense with all the whacked out uh, incentives. incentives that you're talking about. Why not just take all of that money, which I, do we even know how much money is actually put into these things? Uh, of course. So how, how much right now? Um, 600 billion, give or take. <laughs> give or take. All right, so why not take the 600 billion that are on programs that we know are creating as many problems probably as they're fixing, if not more, 
and then do it that way? Like, do you think, because it almost feels like it's a, like a little bit of a stopgap that you'd still have to get to that problem eventually? Well, well that's the beauty of this, um, the freedom dividend proposal, is that you have this 600 billion or so, and then you're saying, hey, guess what? Like, it's now a new right of citizenship, everyone gets it. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna dramatically reduce the enrollment in these programs very, very quickly, because a lot of people will be like, I prefer the cash. And then, uh, then this new incoming population uh, would just opt for the dividend and then never end up on these welfare programs. So you'd end up uh, shrinking the enrollments over time in the way you describe. You just wouldn't do it all at once because you know, there are a lot of people in very distinct situations. Um, and this is actually much more politically uh, feasible and popular than going and trying to tear these programs up and, and uh, you know, from, from the, the roots up. Yeah, are, are you worried though that the that because states have different things related to social programs that, I mean, we sort of addressed this already, but just that different states will deal with it so differently uh, in terms of how they're giving benefits off UBI that it just is gonna create this weird, we may have a gajillion people moving to one state and leaving another state or the rest of it, or you just think that that's? Well, that's one reason why having uniform benefits, because right now there are block grants that go to various states and the states do different things with it, as you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. And those are the programs that would be um, swapped out for UBI, so the more people that opt into UBI, then uh, the, the, the like smaller those grants would be.